This is a production of Cornell University. So, good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome you to Simon Joe's uh, thesis talk. So Simon is presenting his talk today, but he won't actually have his defense till December sometime. Um, this summer, I think the faculty voted to have imminently graduating students do their talks in the, the seminar series. And so Simon is the test case for this, and we seem to have gotten a very good turnout. So thank you all for coming. Um, Simon came to us from um, Shenzhen via the University of Washington in Seattle and is a PhD student in plant biology department. He, however, has more of an ecological background and like many ecology students, he wanted to work on a project that has absolutely nothing to do with his thesis advisor's research. And that also meant then that Simon's thesis has been almost entirely self-funded through TA ships and grants that he's written, which is also typical of ecology students. And specifically, Simon came to me wanting to work on pathogens on roots, which is not something I have a lot of experience with. So I learned a lot from Simon in that respect. And Simon has also really um, pioneered new research methods in my lab, specifically metabolomics and um, quantitative genetics or uh, genome-wide association studies. And more importantly, has been very creative in combining those two re research methods and doing quantitative genetics of large-scale metabolomics and really doing very nice analysis of large data sets. And then applying that, as you can see here from his picture and now somewhat shortened title, um, to looking at fusarium maze interactions, fusarium infection of roots. With that, Simon, thank you. Thank you everyone for showing up today. And uh, I just wanna make sure everybody hear me all right. Good, good. Okay, so we can start. All right, so uh, thank you, George, for the surprisingly kind introduction. So I guess I have to, <laughs> I have to revise my acknowledged section now. Uh, <laughs> that's maybe a little bit too mean worded, but I will think about that while I'm giving the talk. So today I'm going to tell you about what I've been doing for the past three and a half years, which we're looking at trying to identify cellular and physiological regulation of maize biochemical defense against Fusarium graminearum. So as George mentioned, when I first joined George's lab, I really had no idea or very vague idea about what I wanted to do. So only thing I know is I want to work on root microbe interaction, which George doesn't really do any of that. So I went to George and I say, I want to do this and this and that. And George said, okay, the only possible way you can get some money from me is if you work on corn. So that really narrowed down the things I can do here which is corn root disease, which I know absolutely nothing about at the time. So I started from Wikipedia, which surprisingly there's a whole page of giving all the maize diseases that are possibly out there. And that's how I find out about Fusarium graminearum. So Fusarium graminearum is a destructive and widespread fungal pathogen that infect maize. Depending on the tissue type and developmental stages of that interaction, you can get seedling blight, stalk rot, or ear rot in maize. And every year, these three diseases caused by the same pathogen collectively give you hundreds of millions of yield loss so in corn. So this is a pretty economically relevant pathogen to work with. So when we first started to work on this pathogen, we really want to just have some kind of symptom or phenotype to work with. So in a, a, through artificial inoculation experiment, we see that Fusarium can induce significant reduction in the total root growth in the seedlings. So this can be quantified by taking a 2D picture like this and then use a computer algorithm that is developed in Leon Cochin's lab. We can actually quantify that and compare and show that this is statistically significant. And this phenotype actually is, uh, is repeatable and consistent enough such that we can use it to screen a natural diversity panel and see if there's any natural variation in this fungus-induced morphological change. And indeed, when we do that across a diversity panel, we see that B73, which is the reference maize genotype where we've uh, initially started with, turned out to be one of the more susceptible uh, genotypes with its total root growth being reduced by over 50% after fusarium inoculation. Whereas we also see there are four genotypes that does not show any significant reduction in their total root growth after fusarium, after fusarium inoculation. And they turn out to be our candidate uh, resistant genotypes. So for my work, I've been focusing on this genotype, MO17, because it has the most available genetic resources out there. 
And I will come back to that later to explain what I mean by that. So before we go any further, we really want to confirm that the symptom that we observe actually tell us something about resistance level. So we did that by measuring, for example, fungal gene expression, mycotoxin production, as well as visual symptom scoring. And by all three matrices, consistently we see that MO17 turned out to be more resistant uh, than B73 against Fusarium. So then we can actually ask the question, why? What's the genetic and physiological mechanism behind this contrasting resistance level between these two genotypes? So we're answering these questions taking a quantitative genetics approach. So for those of you with less background in that, so uh, we, there are uh, genetic populations that's produced by crossing B73 and MO17 are susceptible and resistant genotype and then produce what we call a recombinant inbred line populations with shuffled genomes between the two parents. And what we can do then is to measure some kind of quantitative phenotype so that we can statistically associate this phenotype with a particular locus or loci within the genome, okay? So then the question really comes down to what kind of trait, what kind of quantitative trait do we really want to measure? So since we're working with plant disease, supposedly what we really want to measure, what actually matter is the disease symptom severity in the field, okay? How does that impact your yield? How does that impact your crops? So it does come with a lot of advantage of doing that. So for example, it's much, the result from such a study will be much easier to translate to application. You tend to identify the loci with the most major effect. You capture environmental influences and the technique for phenotyping is usually simple. However, on the flip side of this, we can also try to quantify some kind of biochemical or molecular markers in the lab. And the advantage of doing that will be you kind of get some idea about what's the mechanism behind the resistance you get. And the genetic architecture of this kind of traits are usually much more simple. And then you can, very importantly, you get very consistent and accurate quantification, which are hard to achieve under field conditions for disease severity. And perhaps more important for graduate students, it's much less work to do, okay? So if we forget about the less work and simple technique, just say we really want to do it right, which kind of phenotype are we going to, are we going to choose for our particular passel system? So if we come back to seedling blight disease caused by Fusarium specifically, we see that consistent scoring of disease symptom severity is very hard, either in, con either in field conditions or even in lab. You know, the symptoms are in the root. So you, what are you going to measure? And secondly, if we come back to the, to the historical statistics, we see that the seedling blight severity varies widely from year to year. And by the way, this is when I started working on this disease. And since then, there's been a linear decrease in disease severity. So somehow I feel like I should take credit for that. Uh, okay, but what the point I'm trying to make here is that the environmental impact seems to be really large for disease severity. And finally, there has been work done with Fusarium maize interaction, but this is done in years. But what's been shown is that the gene, genetic architecture for this interaction is very complex. Many genetic loci seem to contribute to the disease resistance or to disease severity phenotype. So taking all three factors together, we decide to measure biochemical markers under laboratory conditions rather than doing any kind of disease severity scoring. <coughs> so what we decided to do is to take seedling root samples of B73 and MO17 recombinant inbred lines. We take those samples, subject them to LCMS analysis of metabolome, as well as a new technology developed by Carl Kremlin here in, at Buckler's lab, looking, uh, using a 3 prime rna seq technology to look at their transcriptome. And if we combine the metabolomic data with the quantitative genetic setup, we can do some kind of metabolite QTL mapping. And if we combine the two omics uh, data sets, we can start to do cross omics network and system analysis. So most of the work I'm going to present today will come out of these two analysis here, combining the three methods here, okay? So the first story I wanna tell you from this study is looking, uh, looking at just comparing B73 and MO17, our two parental genotypes, with or without fungus inoculation. What I'm showing here are cloud plots, and each bubble here represents a single mass feature that the mass spec machine can detect. And in green, I'm showing the, uh, the metabolites or the mass features that are significantly upregulated by fusarium induction. 
in red are significantly reduced. But really, the take-home message is that a lot of bubbles in B73, not so many bubbles in Mo17. And what that tells you is that B73, the susceptible genotype, seems to be significantly responding, metabolically speaking, to fusarium inoculation, whereas there's not so much going on in Mo17 in terms of its metabolome. So what we can do then is we can compare the constitutive metabolome of the susceptible B73 and the resistant Mo17 and ask what are the differences there, because the differential metabolites would likely be related to resistance against fusarium. And not so surprisingly, we find a lot. Okay, there's, there are over 700 mass features that are significantly different, which is still a lot to work with. Like, which one should we actually look at then? So I did a second comparison looking at fungus induction in B73. And from there, we found over 300 met metabolites or mass features that are significantly different. And if we look for the overlap between these two, which means these metabolites are both constitutively different between my susceptible and resistant genotype, as well as being responsive to fungus inoculation. Those will be my high priority pool. So I find less than 100 mass features there. And if I filter out the ones that have low intensity, that's harder to work with. And then we find about 30 mass features. So among these 30 mass features, there are some known metabolites with uh, bioacti uh, bioactivities against fusarium, which will be good positive control for us to show that this approach is actually effective. But what we're actually more interesting are the unknowns here. So what are the unknowns? Two of the unknowns that really capture my eyes are these two mass features shown by their negative mode mass to charge ratio here and retention time. So from now on, I'm just re uh, refer, to them to, refer to them as A19 and 777. And you see that in both B73 and Mo17, they are inducible by fungus inoculation, and they're constitutively different between our two genotypes. And what's really interesting to me then, uh, okay, okay, is that the structure seems to be related to each other. And Kitty Zhang uh, in Frank Schroeder's lab helped me to fur uh, purify these two compounds and perform 2D NMR on them to clarify their structures here. So we have a sucrose backbone right here, connected to them, one ferulic acid, two ferulic acid, and then different acetyl groups. And really the only difference between these two metabolites is this one additional acetyl group here on the two position, okay? So these metabolites have previously been reported in medicinal plants, uh, such as Smilex, in this case, Smilex China. And that's why they, have the, uh, they go with, by the name such as smuglicide C and smilicide A. So those are names given by the natural chemist and Okay, so they're fine in this kind of plant, and to me, they're really dear to heart because I kind of grow up eating it. <laughs> so in China, you can make, you can make this dark jello-like thing from Smilex, and supposedly it will be re enriched in, in this smuglicide and smilicide compound, and you can just have it as a dessert. Okay, so that's cool. Then we really, if they're res related to resistance against fusarium, they want to show, is there any in vitro bioactivity against fusarium? And that's where it's really interesting. When we did an in vitro liquid culture assay, we see that the triacetylated smuglicide C does not show any significant acti activity against fusarium. Whereas the biacetylated smuglicide A show you a significant growth uh, inhibition. And notice that the concentration of smilicide A is actually lower than smuglicide C because this is reflecting their in vivo, uh, in vivo concentration. So even at low concentration, the diacetylated smilicide A seems to be more bioactive than the triacetylated smuglicide C. Okay? So then we can ask the question, why, are the, why is there natural variation between, uh, for these two compounds in our population? So we measure these two compounds across the recombinant inbred lines, which can help us to identify the genetic loci that is controlling or associated with these two, with these two metabolites. And per perhaps not so surprisingly, we see a co-localized quantitative trait locus or QTL at the beginning of chromosomes three. So if we, if we subset the recombinant inbred line population by different alleles at this locus, we see that for the ones that carry the B73 allele, they preferentially accumulate smuglicide C, just like B73, the parental line, whereas it has less of the smuglicide A. So that's pretty good segregation. 
And then we want to confirm the mapping results from recombinant inbred lines using a different genetic population called near isogenic lines, also generated from B73 and MO17. And indeed, we find that when we have B73 and MO17, here the phenotype I'm measuring is the ratio of these two metabolites. In B73, we have a lot of smiglocyte C and uh, not so much smiglocyte A, so we have a very low bar, whereas in MO17, it's the other way around. And when we look at the near isogenic lines, some of them look just like B73. And the letter here uh, annotates what's the genetic background. So even though, for example, these two lines, the genetic background is MO17, it does have a B73-like phenotype. And we have example from, uh, from the other side, whereas when you have, even if you have a B73 genetic background, their phenotype looks just like MO17. When we do a t-test uh, t between them, we see that there is indeed a significant difference between these different uh, near isogenic lines. And then on top, I'm showing the genetic map associated with all these near isogenic lines, whereas in red, I'm showing the B73 allele. In blue, I'm showing the MO17 allele. So if you look at the correspondence between the phenotype and genotype, we can actually further narrow down our QTL area to less than three, uh, 600 KB. So this particular area would contain <laughs> the gene that we think is causing the difference uh, in smiglocyte C and smiglocyte A constitutive abundance. So remember, these two compounds are only different by one acetyl group. So when we're looking at this QTL result, we say, okay, that's pretty straightforward. We're looking for acetylotransferase that's going to add acetyl group to, uh, to smiglocyte A. And of course, when you look at there, there's no acetyltransferase there. So for that part, I was, so, so at that time, this whole project looks kind of dead in the water. We don't have a candidate gene. We have a small genetic area, but we really don't know. You know there's probably a dozen genes in there. We really don't know which one we should look at. So that's when I was taking a vacation and visiting my wife last December, okay? And I was really bored in her office and I have nothing to do. So I decided to play with some of this data I saw that was hopeless at the time. So I decided to plot out all the MO17, B73 and their recombinant inbred lines based on their constitutive concentration of these two compounds. So that's when I noticed something rather weird. So we know all, the, uh, all along that MO17 has a lot of smilocyte A, not so much smiglocyte C, and we know the opposite is true for B73. So for all this time, I've been assuming that all the recombinant inbred lines should be distributed kind of in a negatively correlated way, right? Because if we assume that, or if we hypothesize that there is a difference in the acetyltransfer rates, then you should have either a lot of the substrate or a lot of the product. So then you'll have a negative correlation. But that's not the case here. If you see that, you see a clear positive correlation trend. Actually, more than that, there seems to be two separate classes, one being more like MO17, the other being more like B73, okay? So I was like, if only there's one way I can draw a line here and separate them. And that's when the advantage of marrying a statistician become really, uh, really great, okay? So, uh, so basically, my wife said, oh, you just need a linear discrimination analysis to be done here. I was like, let's do that, whatever that is, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> That's exactly what she did for me. And we show that we can actually separate the recombinant inbred lines into the MO17 like ones versus the B73 like ones. So we can separate this, uh, this population based on their phenotypes. So we have two phenotypic classes. And if we say that there's some kind of genes that's causing this dif uh, discrimination, then the expression, uh, expression of that gene should be significantly different between my two phenotypic classes. So that's exactly what I did when I compare the uh, gene expression data between these phenotypic, two phenotypic classes across the entire genome. So here I'm showing the negative log of p-value based on students' t-test, and we see that th the genes that are most significantly differentially expressed between these two phenotypic class indeed locate right within my QTL area. If I zoom into like, this QTL area, the gene that's most differentially expressed is acetylene insensitive 2 which is an acetylene receptor that's positively regulating uh, acetylene signaling. So if we look at the segregation within the population, we see that the recombinant inbred lines that have a phenotype that just look like B73 tend to express IN2 at a much high, significantly higher level. So this would uh, lead us to the hypothesis that uh, IN2 expression and hence acetylene signaling is a positive regulator of smilocyte A to smiglocyte C transition. 
Okay, so and we can test that hypothesis uh, ideally by looking at iron two mutant, but that's not available in maize. So we did the next next best thing we can do, which is looking at an ethylene biosynthetic mutant, which constitutively make less ethylene. So when we compare B73, its well-type gene uh, background, and ACS26 mutant, which produce less acetylene, indeed, we see that there's less uh, smiglicide C and smiglicide A being produced constitutively. And what's even more exciting is that we can actually rescue this phenotype by exogenously adding acetylene back to the seedlings. And in the well-type background, you can actually induce these two compounds with exogenous acetylene. So with this experiment, we have demonstrated that two novel compounds found in maize, smiglicide A, a smiglicide C, and smiglicide A, that are related to fusarium resistance are positively regulated by ethylene signaling in vivo. So that's the first story. So, so far, how does this fit in with the, the literature about ethylene and fusarium? So in barley and wheat, it has been shown that ethylene actually contribute to the susceptibility of fusarium. So in this case, for example, if you treat barley leaves with ethylene, you get stronger symptom and more fungal canidia. Whereas in wheat, if you have a transgenic line that produces less ethylene, then you have a, a less severe phenotype. Okay, so this fit in with our result really well because we show that ethylene promotes smilocyte A, which is the bioactive compound, transition into smiglicide C, which is the deactivated form. So it looks like uh, the smiglicide C and smiglicide A provide some kind of biochemical link between acetylene signaling and fusarium resistance. Okay? So, so far we've looked at two particular metabolites <coughs> that are significantly different between the two genotypes. Okay? What we cannot do, unfortunately, is to tell you how much these two metabolites actually contribute to resistance quantitatively. Because we only found ethylene as an important factor. We cannot specifically manipulate these two compounds in vivo. So really, if you look back, we found over 700 metabolites or mass features that are significantly different between the two genotypes. And any one of those could give you a disproportional impact on fusarium resistance. And there's really no reason I'm tell, uh, I can tell you that this two compound that I just tell you is much more significant than every other, every other thing in this 700 pools, okay? But what I did show you is that we can do QTL mapping with mass features, and that does give, uh, lead us to somewhere in terms of the genetic control. So if we can do gen QTL mapping for two mass features, there's really nothing to stop us from doing it for all 700 mass features. So the only thing is that instead of showing you loss score for two metabolites, I'm going to show you the distribution of QTL for all these 700 mapping that I did. So in result, on this plot, every, on the x-axis, I'm laying out the genetic locus on the, uh, in their chromosomal order. And on y-axis, instead of looking at how strongly that particular locus is associated with one particular metabolite, instead I'm measuring how many metabolites that give you a significant QTL at that particular locus. Okay, so immediately we recognize this tower in bin 2.09 towards the end of chromosome 2. Okay, and this is really interesting because bin 2.09 has been previously associated with multiple disease resistance before in maize. So then our question is, what's happening in here? What are the genes that is giving, that's affecting all these metabolites? Because collectively they affect over 70, meta, uh, 70 mass features. That's about 10% of what's different between these two genotypes together, okay? And is there only one gene in there that's affecting all these metabolites uh, simultaneously? Or are there just multiple genes that's in a short genetic interval kind of clustering together, okay? And this is, when you translate that into physical distance, we still have about eight megabase to cover and hundreds of genes in there. So again, we, we can't possibly come up with any red, uh, candidate genes just by looking at this plot. So what we did there then is we can get to the QTL by doing metabolite QTL mapping, but when we can also look at the expression of genes and then ask the question, how is gene expression correlated with our metabolite abundance across this recombinant inbred line population? And our hypothesis is that if there's only one gene in there 
then that one gene should be significantly correlated with all the mass features that map to this locus. Whereas if there are multiple genes in the interval, each regulating a subset, then only the subset and their regulator gene should be correlated with each other. So what's the result that we got from that? In this, ca in this case, I'm laying out all the transcripts across, uh, across the genome of maize. And then on the y-axis, I'm measuring the median Pearson's correlation coefficient of that 75 mass feature with each transcript. And again, we start to see this very cl uh, clean signal within our QTL region in bin 2.09. If we zoom in there and ask for each transcript, what's the number of mass features that has that particular transcript as the most single most correlated transcript? We see that we have a clear winner in a putative vesicular tra transport protein, which would suggest that this single protein is regulating many metabolites simultaneously. So to, uh, to actually prove that hypothesis or dem uh, support that hypothesis, we found two independent mutation insertion lines that has this particular gene knocked out. And when we can confirm the insertion, we see that there's a trend of decrease in this very important metabolite, defense metabolite called Dimboa glucoside. So at this point, I have no statistics to support my claim because this is based on very small sample size, but we're in the process of bulking up the seeds so that hopefully soon we'll add asterisks here. So this will show us that Indeed, the vesicular transport protein is important, to, uh, it's important for the metabolism of defense metabolites such as thimboa glucoside. But that's kind of unexpected. How could a vesicular transport protein related to met secondary metabolism? So one way we look at it is, how about if we look at the biosynthetic pathway of benzoxenoids, of which thimboa glucoside is a member of? So we see that because without a glucoside, diboa, dimboa, all these benzoxenoids are highly cytotoxic. So for plant cells, it actually makes sense for them to be kept in the vacuole in the mi and the microsomes. So we think that the, the biosynthetic genes should also localize in the cellular compartments, which are made from vesicles. So if there is some kind of a disruption in the vesicular transport protein or in that particular vesicular transport protein, uh, then there might, be something, there might be something disrupting this entire biosynthetic pathway as well. Okay, so, so far I've been done all the studies within the realm of IB, uh, B73 MO17 recombinant inbred lines. I've shown you we can do mapping with two metabolites or we can do mapping across the entire metabolome. However, there are limited genetic diversity looking at this recombinant inbred lines. As I've shown you, there are only 700, over, slightly over 700 mass features that we can map with this population. But what I hope I've convinced you is that this experimental approach of combining metabolomics, transcriptomics, and quantitative genetics is really powerful when it comes to dissecting the secondary metabolism. So we decided to take this approach, extend it to a much more chemically diverse genetic uh, genome-wide association study panel, which includes over 280 geno uh, genotypes. And from there, we found more than 3,900 mass features that we can dissect using the exact same approach, okay? So we're lucky that the same diversity panel, the transcriptome has previously been, uh, has only recently been uh, analyzed by Carl Kremlin here, in Ed Buckler's group. So we use the exact same tissue type and we try to keep the growth condition as consistent as possible. Looking at this will be the emergent third leaf, looking at the tip of that and the base of it, okay? So we harvest the tip and, uh, and base of all this over 280 lines and then perform, some, uh, perform metabolomic analysis. So the first thing before we even go into the genetics is we try to parse out the vast uh, data set that we have. How can we explain the variance in this pretty big data set? So the first thing we see that is, uh, the first thing we see is that the tissue type seems to be really important, not so surprisingly. So the base and tip seems to clustering very well with each other. So that means we should probably analyze those data sets separately from each other. Another way to visualize this is that if we can do two-way ANOVA on every single mass feature and say, how are they different either by tissue 
or by genetic subpopulation or interactive. And we see the vast majority of them are significantly different based on tissue type. Whereas by genetically defined, uh, defined subpopulations, less of them are actually significantly different. Okay, so when it comes to metabolomics, an uh, always bothering question is, you know, what are the metabolites? So people always ask, oh, th ask, oh this is great, so, but, but what are the metabolites? Unfortunately, not like in transcriptomics, you can map to the genome and say, okay, this is this gene and this is that gene. You can't really say that with metabolites. They're only very limited information we have in hand. So when we want to say, what's, what are the metabolites that's driving the differentiation between you know, different tissue types, we really have a hard time. So to address that question, I look at my, uh, I look at my chromatogram. So this is a uh, UV absorption chrom uh, chromatogram for my analysis. So at the beginning, things are uh, more polar, and at the end, things are more nonpolar. But what I, uh, what I come to realize is that you can actually divide this based on their retention time or based on their relative polarity. And we know that these are physiologically relevant because we can click into every single uh, peak in here, which represent a metabolite, and look at their UV absorption profile. So we see that the peaks in this area tend to have identical or similar UV absorption profile that's characteristic of phenolic acid. Sim uh, similarly, uh, peaks within this area looks like benzoxinoids, and peaks within this area looks like flavonoids. And this is probably not so surprising if you think about if they are the same class of compounds, which means they're structurally related to each other, then their polarity should be more or less similar to each other as well, right? So that means we can divide, we can subset our chromatograms into different groups and then putatively say, are they different in this retention time range? Then we can say, oh, maybe they're different mostly because of phenolic acid. And if they're different mostly in this area of the chromatogram, then it's the flavonoids that's causing the difference. So indeed, when we look at this, we can plot the negative log of p-value from our previous two-way ANOVA analysis. And what you see is that each dot here represents a single mass feature, and they're not distributed uniformly across our chromatogram, okay? For example, when we compare tissue type, we see there are significantly more uh, mass features that are significantly different within the flavonoid, uh, flavonoid time range. Whereas when we look at uh, the mass features that's differentiating between subpopulation, they're almost exclusively within the benzoxenoid range, okay? So we can actually compare the negative log of p-value from two-way ANOVA with another one-way ANOVA and then say, is there any significant difference between each retention time group? And the answer is yes, okay? What you're eyeballing is actually happening. So for tissue type, most of the uh, most of differentiating parts are within the flavonoid time range, whereas for the subpop genetic subpopulation, they're mostly differentiated based on benzoxenoids. Okay, so is that actually happening? We can look at some uh, examples. Okay, so for example, if we compare the lift tip and lift base, and this is total UV absorption profile, and we see that there's clear absence of any flavonoids in the leaf base. So we see that flavonoids are exclusively found in the tip of the, of the leaf, okay? So that's the primary driving factor of differentiating these two tissue types. And when we look at genetic defined subpopulations, we see that benzoxenoids, such as in this case, dimboa, is significantly lower in tropical lines, whereas the same tropical lines tend to uh, accumulate a different benzoxenoid compound called H-dimboa glucoside, okay? So we do find out the same thing looking at specifics uh, as well as the global analysis. So, so far I've been showing you analysis based on a priori knowledge, okay? So we know that the, the different samples can be uh, categorized into e either tip or base, or they can, can be categorized into different genetically defined subpopulations. But how about if we just examine this big data set without any a priori knowledge? I just want to know how are the mass features distributed across my entire population, okay? So in these two plots, again, I'm analyzing the tip and base data separately from each other. On the x-axis, I'm looking at the frequency for each mass feature at, at which it's being detected. So basically, this is a histogram, right? Whereas on y-axis is how often they are. So we see that both in tip and base, we have a bimodal distribution. Okay, 
So there are about 15% of all the mass features that we detected are found almost ubiquitously. Like over 90% of the meta uh, geno genotypes that we examined have these mass features. Whereas we also have this significant tail, over 40 per 30 to 40% of the metabolites are only found in less than 20% of the entire population. And I think this really, really highlights the vast chemical diversity that's existing within this population. And you can think of this kind of as essential metabolites that's found ubiquitously, and then something like expendable metabolites, if you will. And we also see that there's this actually a significant difference in how this two distri a distribution look like between the two tissue, type, tissue types, such that in the base, you have more of the expendable metabolites, whereas in the tip, distribution is actually more flat. Okay, so the bimodal uh, pattern is, more, uh, is less obvious. Okay, so, but when I first got this result, my concern was really, are these tails really just noise from my metabolomics analysis? Because those are the exact same pattern what you would expect from, metab uh, from LCMS noise, okay? They tend to occur in very small subset of your entire population, and they're kind of accounting a big part of your data set. So it will, be, it will kind of suck if you publish this and find out, oh, all these are actually just noise, not true metabolites. So one characteristic associated with mass spec noise is that they also tend to have lower intensity because they're, they're just machine noise. They're not representative of true metabolites found in samples. So what I decided to test is to see, does the uh, occurrence frequency somehow correlate with the intensity of a, of a mass feature? So in both tip and base, we find a very weak positive correlation. So it does seems like the ones that occur at lower frequency tend to have lower intensity as well. But you also see that this distribution is so broad, you have mass features that occur, for example, almost less than 10% uh, of the population that have higher intensity than the ones that's found ubiquitously. So we do think that most of the mass features that we are finding here are not noise from the machine. But I think you have already noticed that across this positive uh, correlation, we also have noticeable exceptions, okay? So these mass features here are occurring less than 20% of all, our, uh, all the genotypes we have examined, but they are found at very high intensity. They're colored based on a 95% uh, confidence interval of a linear regression, okay? So we decided to look at some of this. So what are these mass features that are rare but occurring at high intensity? So when we look at this three, for example, showing one of them have a mass to charge ratio of 353.5, we see that actually you can find the exact same mass feature, uh, exact, you can find the exact same mass to charge rate, uh, range in, another, uh, in other genotypes, okay? So for example, in this genotype called 4226, we have these two metabolites with that particular mass to charge ratio. However, in CML45, we have a completely different, uh, different peak showing up that has the exact same molecular weight, but different retention time. And they're actually occurring at much higher intensity so that you see the original two uh, peaks tend to be really short or really small in this case. So that means we, I interpret this as a rare isomer. So they have exact same molecular weight, but different polarity. So different 2D structure so that they elude at a different retention time. Okay, so when we look at all three of this, what's really interesting is that all three of them show you the exact, have a shared uh, MSMS or tandem MS fragment. Okay, so this metabolites can be fragmented so that you get the parental ion, but also the fragment ion. So you see all three of these rare but high intensity metabolites have a shared fragment, which means they're structurally related. If you do the mass between them, you have a hydroxylation, and a methylation, okay? So that further uh, strengthens our hypothesis that they are probably structurally related with each other. And if we look at the occurrence of these three metabolites or three mass features, so on, on here, I'm showing a pseudophylogeny of my 282 population. And then on the lower, the color, uh, the color plot in blue, I'm showing where that mass feature is being detected at high intensity, whereas in yellow, they're not detected. And you see that most of the time, there are co-occurrence, which means when you find one of them, all three of them are probably there. 
Okay, so this strongly suggests that these three metabolites, they're rare, they're high intensity, and they're structurally related to each other. Okay, so we really want to now uh, look for, you know, what's the genetic basis? Why do we sometimes have these rare isomers? Why sometimes we have the more common ones? So for that, again, that's when we need to do the genome-wide association study. But before we actually look at any of these unknown metabolites, we want to make sure that our GWAS is actually working. So that's when we go back to our old friend benzoxenoids, where we previously used biparental mapping population of these metabolites and then correctly identify their respective biosynthetic genes. So we want to use this as our positive controls for the GWAS study and say, can we recover the same gene using the same mass feature or the same metabolites? Okay. And the answer is yes. When we map with dim 2 ball glucoside, we found its biosynthetic gene BX13. And we map with, when we map with h ball glucoside, not only did we find the previously identified biosynthetic gene BX12, we also found this significant SNP unknown located towards the end of chromosome 9. So that's really interesting. So I got sidetracked a little bit. So I want to know, what is this unknown? Why, why do I have another SNP here? So we know BX12 is a biosynthetic gene. Is this another biosynthetic gene here? So that's when I go to the genome and then look at B73 versus CML247 genome. So CML247 is a tropical line. Remember previously I mentioned tropical lines tend to have higher amount of h dimboa glucoside. However, when we compare their genome, there doesn't seem to be any structural variation in terms of presence absence, okay? And that's where our GWA snippets are located. So our clear candidate at this point will be this gene right here, which encodes a protein phosphatase 2C family protein, okay? So the way we look at this is I go back to Carl's expression data and then plot out its expression across our entire GWAS lines. And then we take the two tails of this expression distribution and then compare their h dimboa glucoside metabolites. And indeed, we see that for the lines that express this gene at high level, they tend to have significantly higher h dimboa glucoside. So this will be strong evidence suggesting that this, the expression of this gene at least is co-segregating with our metabolic phenotype, which means this would be a very nice candidate gene to say, does that actually regulate h dimboa glucoside biosynthesis or metabolism in vivo? Okay, so that's a good side story from the positive control. How about the rare isomers we were talking about earlier? So we did genetic mapping again. So this is rather preliminary state, uh, data at this point. So I'd use a slightly different genetic data set. But what we find out is that these three potentially structurally related metabolites map to the same exact locus towards the end of chromosome four. So probably not too surprising. We've seen this before. <coughs> the structurally related ferroloyal sucroses map to the same locus as well. Okay, so what is within this locus then? So lucky for us, one of the lines that have this rear isomers, again, is CML247, which we have the genome. So we compare the genome of CML247 with B73, and what we found is a 40 KB insertion with, uh, specific to the CML247, which contained four uh, putative gene models, one of them being a, uh, one of them being a putative ensocyanin biosynthesis regulator. So ensocyanin is also in the phenylpropanoid pathway, so we think that maybe this is what we're looking for. But at this point, I think at least we have preliminary evidence associated this, associating this 40 KB insertion with those rare isomers that we observed. Okay, so so far I've been again looking at individuals. But remember, I mentioned there are over 3,900 mass features that we can map. And if you just do that one by one for, and look at that manually every, for every one of them, you know, that take probably 3,900 graduate students to do that, okay? So instead, I compile their GWAS results. And then again, on the x-axis, I'm looking at genetic locus or SNPs. And then I'm counting for each SNP or each genetic locus, how many metabolite GWAS hit that I got. And again, we start to see these towers coming up, okay? Which means small genetic locus associated with large parts of the metabolism, okay? So then, what are the metabolites that map to there? Again, it's always a question about what, what are the metabolites? What are the mass features? Remember, I've already come up with a putative solution to that, which is looking at retention time, okay? So what we see is that 
structurally related metabolites tend to have clustered retention time, okay? So what we can do then is to say, if we measured the variance of retention time of mass features that map to the same locus, that give us a, a measure of how structurally related are those, okay? So that's exactly what I did. So in this plot, I'm measuring the log of variance of retention time. You see the background level up here, and you start to see all these valleys dipping down, which means the mass features are physically clustered together on the chromatogram. And if we compare this plot to the GWAS result, we have almost perfect correspondence, okay? Whenever you have a peak on the number of GWAS hits in the genome, you also have a valley in the retention time. What that tells us is that structurally related metabolites tend to be regulated by the same locus in the genome. When you say that out loud, it makes a lot of sense, but when you want, to, want your data to say that to you, it takes a little bit more work. So we can actually try to identify what are the genes or what are the structural variants there that's associated. We see that in red, there are, for example, known benzoxenoid biosynthetic genes that we can recover from this analysis. And also in blue, there will be the putative unknowns. Okay. Okay, so in summary, what have I told you today? So I've told you three stories. First, we discovered two metabolites that has not been reported in maize before, called smilocyte A and smilocyte C. We think they're related to fusarium graminearum resistance. And we show you that acetylene signaling and probably IN2 expression is positively regulating this acetylation reaction. And then we extend that from single metabolite to across the entire metabolome to show you that correlation between metabolomics and transcriptomics analysis can help us to pinpoint candidate genes from quantitative genetics results. And finally, we extended that same approach to a much more diverse GWAS and uh, GWAS population and show you at a global scale that structurally related metabolites tend to be co-regulated by the same locus in the genome. Okay, so I think with that being said, I think that's all of my research part, I would like to take a pause here before my long and emotional acknowledgement section and everybody forget about your questions. So I would like to take any questions you may have. Thank you. <laughs> Josh. Yeah, so it's um, a lot to consider here. Um, I know. A lot of nice work. Uh, so, when you look at the uh, sampling the tip, which is a well differentiated, terminal differentiated tissue, and the base of the leaf, where you have uh, still you know many cells elongating, some differentiating, depending on you know where the state is, uh, status is of the leaf. Across the 282 diversity panel, wouldn't you suspect that there's a lot of variation still within the base of the leaf, and that could be um, that could be influencing some of your results too? I mean, like when you, when you look at the metabolites there? Definitely, so I think uh, one of the major concerns is, you know, when we do a GWAS, we hope to explain the variance in phenotype by variance in genotype, right? But then there's no way you can, you can talk about that outside the framework of development. So there will be uh, differentiation in development. And indeed, many of, the, many of the genotypic difference we saw are probably can be attributed to uh, different biological differences in rate of development. So we try to do that as consistently as, pos as consistently as possible. But you know, if we map to an oxygen response factor, that, that's also biologically true, right? So it's, it's biologically relevant. So we're not just looking at uh, biosynthetic enzyme in, in secondary metabolism pathway per se. So, um, yeah. Uh, good question. <laughs> so, first, you talked about three isomers, and then, but then you showed that they're actually different by oxygen and methylene group. So they're not isomers, they're derivatives. So do they have the same mass and the isomers, or they are? Yeah, so, so, so sorry, I, that, uh, I, I probably didn't say that very clearly there. So there are three, the 353, there are isomers. So if we go back. Sorry, guys. I have to mess up somewhere. Um, okay, so both disk chromatograms are done with master charge ratio, the same master charge ratio. 
So these two are isomers, okay, right? Because they have the same uh, uh, molar weight, but different retention times, okay? But what I'm saying is that this is only one of these dots up here. The 369 and the 383s are the other two. I'm not saying these three are isomers of each other, but rather there are a series of rare isomers, which you can find a more, com a more common counterpart in other genotypes. The second question is, um, if you look at the chemical diversity of the 700 compounds from your first part, mm -hmm. uh, do, you have, do you have an idea if there are some classes of compounds or are they related to each other in any way? Uh, Sorry, can you say the first part of your question again? I didn't question. 700, uh, well, 700 features that you got from the differential analysis of two genotypes, mm -hmm. system and not. Mm -hmm. uh, can you say if there's how, how chemically diverse they are? Right, uh, so apparently the data is there. So we can use the same kind of retention time analysis <laughs> to say, you know, where are all those 700 uh, mass features uh, located in my chromatogram? And that gives us some idea about what they are. And my guess, based on the GWAS results, is that they're probably mostly in, mostly in the uh, benzoxenoid pathway as well. That would be my guess, but I don't know that. Yep. Class. So you're, you're very, the beginning of your, of your slides, you showed the screen of the mid polarity metabolites. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And so what about if you take other classes, say more you know, sugars or exactly. what would happen then? Yeah, we, we then? don't know. You, uh, so, so why did you choose this particular, you know, range of hydrophobicity? Good question. So when we look at this, uh, remember, I, I know towards the end, kind of fusarium just fought out of the picture. So sorry for, 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 for the fun, fungal biologists here. But remember, we're trying to look at secondary metabolites. We're trying to look for metabolites with known, uh, that's associated with biochemical defense. Uh, so that's why we decided to use a 50% methanol extract where we get most of the so-called mid-polarity metabolites. Whereas if you look at sugars, you know, or primary metabolites, they're, they are important for biochemical defense, but traditionally they're not associated with that. And also you can, you can make the argument to say, why are you not looking at lipids? You know? so, so whenever you're lo looking at metabolomics, it's never comprehensive per se. So the argument we are making here are limited to, you know, really, if you look at the chromatogram, we really see primarily three major classes of compounds. We see phenolic acid, we see benzoxenoids, and we see flavonoids. I can't tell you anything about sugars or lipids or whatever. Yeah. So the question, the question is, uh, at the beginning of my slide, I make the argument that biochemical and molecular markers are less work, but this doesn't look like less work. <laughs> so, so uh, can you can you try to correlate what we observe here? to any kind of, uh, for example, disease symptoms that we can measure. So I think correlation will be a little bit too ambitious to achieve, but what we can do is to do a pairwise comparison, which you cannot do if you just started out the quantitative genetics approach by directly scoring symptoms, okay? So right now, since we have identified specific locus that's associated with metabolites that are probably associated with resistance, then we can say, let's find a mutant in this particular gene, and then we can do pairwise comparison. Is there any significant difference between uh, my mutant versus well type that we know are only different by this biochemical phenotype? And that's exactly what I'm planning to do with the vesicular, tra uh, vesicular transport protein. Because in that case, I have a very specific manipulation genetically. So I can say, not only can I test, is there any biochemical difference between my mutant and well type, is there a significant difference in their biological phenotype in terms of disease resistance? Unfortunately, we cannot do that for the ferrular sucrose part because it's IN2. If you knock out IN2 or if you disturb acetylene pathway, yeah, you will see a phenotype that, that, that you, you can say that's because the ferrular sucrose because, because there are 2,000 other things that's also changed in vivo. Do you have any idea? 
the, on the mechanism of this compound. I mean, they're, they're primarily working against <coughs> seria. Mm -hmm. So, of the ferrula sucrose. Is there a mem membrane? Uh, of the ferrula sucrose, you mean? Oh, sorry, uh, the, the smiglosite C and smilosite A. I don't know. I'm asking if, if what, what uh, the compound that is active, mm -hmm. do you have any idea? Or what kind of mechanism? Yeah. Yeah. So there are, I would say, two classes of mechanisms that's been associated with resistance. So the first class, for example, phenolic acids, it's been shown that it has in vivo, uh, in vitro activity. So it means that somehow it's biocidal or it inhibits the growth. Okay. So molecular, a molecular mechanism, we don't really know. So there are antioxidants. So antioxidants are thought to be good, but you know, we don't really know. But on the other hand, probably something more relevant is that um, usually phenolic acids are associated with structural, uh, structural uh, fortification is the word I'm looking for. Okay, so vast majority of the phenolic acid you found in planta are actually esterified to the cell wall. So it's been shown that one of the major response, uh, one of the first response to fun uh, fungal infection is that you have this major production induction of phenolic acid, and they tend to all go towards cell wall and reinforce their cell wall. So if the two compounds that we found actually play a role by reinforcing the cell wall, then we would not have captured that activity with the in vitro inhibition for, uh, assay. I hope that answered your question. So in the last analysis that you did, uh, the, you showed that values of metabolites are a good way of finding genes that are important. So I um, think that approach is more biased towards finding large, large effect uh, loci in the genome, right? So, but you also have MQTLs for other 3,000 metabolites. That you, so do you, what are your thoughts on prioritizing that list for uh, <coughs> For the That's a good question. I got exact same questions before. Uh, so my idea is that now that we are, I think we are in an era where data generation, it's always going to outpace data analysis. You can kind of, you can do this kind of global analysis, but then when you try to dive into specifics, you have to go in with hypothesis. So you can say, okay, now I associate this metabolite with some kind of biological phenotype that I'm interested in. Then I can go in to say, you know, what are the genes? What are my GWAS results? And what I found, uh, what, what I believe will be valuable from this analysis is not necessarily, you know, the, the final correspondence between uh, structural related, relatedness and a particular genome, lo a genetic locus, but rather in the future, if you have a candidate compound that you're interested in, and then you can go to this data set, the GWAS result is right there, and you can just go and say, what is my candidate gene? And basically, you reduce entire PhD thesis to, to two experiments, right? With the, with the you know, maturation of, um, of CRISPR and other genome editing technology, you can say, okay, I, here I have a very clear candidate gene. If I've altered that, does that, do I have a chemical phenotype? Do I have a biological phenotype? And I think that's the way this resource can be used in the future. I wonder if there is any correlation between the pathogen the localization with the, you know, the metabolite and also the cell type. So where the pathogen localization? The pathogen localization. I haven't thought about that too much. So um, we know that from, from uh, so, so you can transform this uh, fungus with GFP and then do fungus tracking. We know that initially it grows intercellularly and then, that, uh, and then during the intercellular phase it produces mycotoxin and kills the plant cell and then move into a more intracellular slash necrotrophic phase. So, um, for all, uh, so first, for all the metabolomic QTL analysis, we did it constitutively. There's no fungus induction whatsoever. And for all the earlier induction experiment that I did, there are six days post inoculation. So they're barely start transitioning into the intracellular phase. So I'm not exactly sure, you know, how metabolically the plant will switch between as, as the fungus switch from an intercellular to intra, intracellular lifestyle. But I think there's been a lot of transcriptomics analysis done on that front. So uh, that's probably a good way to look at it. Okay, so my, my, uh, my advisor is just reminding me I also have an acknowledgement to do, and he also wants to have lunch. So <clears throat> let's do that. So, is there, so 
one thing that I'm not sure I have the uh, luxury to do anymore now that I'm doing it on a Friday uh, time slot is that to have a very, very long acknowledgement to, to recognize everybody in my family. And uh, uh, apparently, you know, I wouldn't be the person I am without all their help and their company. But so I try to uh, restrict my acknowledgement to all the people I've met here in Cornell. So I want to recognize all my collaborators here without whose work, none of this will be possible. Uh, so throughout the talk, I hope you recognize that this is a really diverse project. We use many, many different approaches and I'm no expertise in any of those. So the only expertise I have is to find the right person and do the right experiment for me. Okay, so I really want to thank everybody here uh, that helped me throughout the entire project. So I, over, over my time here, I've also been extensively working with students, uh, both uh, undergraduate and summer interns. They make my life so much more fun. And my wife and I can go to cruise tour when they take pictures of fruit. So that's pretty good. And also I want to recognize all my lab mates throughout this time. So it's been uh, obviously been evolving over time. And I really want to thank them for all the inspiration, all the ideas I got from them, as well as their patience to listen to all my brain dump. Uh, also, I want to recognize my committee members, Rebecca Nelson and Gary Bergstrom, who both have been really inspirational, very supportive, and very resourceful. Uh, and I think, uh, again, this project wouldn't have been done without any of their help. And of, of course, finally, um, I want to recognize the advisor. Okay? And in the Gender Lab, it's kind of a tradition that uh, at, the, at, at your exit seminar, you want to give kind of a famous philosophical quote, directly actual quote from George. So in the past, his uh, bicycling habit has been the subject of discussion. So here I want to, uh, I want to take this quote here, right here. Okay, so this happened when we we're visiting an alpaca farm in, uh, in Trumansburg, and they also have <laughs> pigs here. So that's what George said to me. Uh, so, I, so the context is, I think it's, I think, oh, pigs, oh. Uh. And George said, pigs are great. They treat you equally as one of themselves. And I think that's also the same kind of philosophy that George has been using to treat his graduate students, that he treats his graduates equally as one of himself. Uh, so, but I do realize I need to give a little bit more context next time I present in conference and say that George, present, uh, George treat his grad students like pigs. So that, that didn't quite come out right. And, uh, Last but not least, I want to recognize everybody here who take the time to come. I really want to say, you know, the, my time here in Cornell would not be the same without any of you. Uh, so uh, you may not, we, we may not be collaborated directly on my thesis project. I probably met you in the class. We probably worked together as teaching staff and um, we probably were students together in the class. And all those interactions really gave me idea and I really own a big time to all of you guys. And really from this project, I think one of the message I got is at this time where the merit of diversity is often being questioned and sometimes being attacked, I can reflect on my own experience in Cornell and stay convinced that if life itself is an emergent property, then our society and our science should also be greater than some of all its parts. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.